Hello everyone and welcome to this eChurch video for Sunday the 23rd of August, the 11th Sunday after Trinity. I do hope that you're managing to find some time for rest and relaxation during the summer months, albeit uh, under restrictions and continued strangeness in our circumstances. I hope also that this uh, video will help you to pray and to continue in your life of Christian discipleship. May God bless you all. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ have mercy, Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Almighty God who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God of glory, the end of our searching, help us to lay aside all that prevents us from seeking your kingdom and to give all that we have to gain the pearl beyond all price through our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen to me, you that pursue righteousness, you that seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father, and to Sarah who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, but I blessed him and made him many. For the Lord will comfort Zion, he will comfort all her waste places, and will make her wilderness like Eden a desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Listen to me, my people, and give heed to me, my nation. For a teaching will go out from me, and my justice for a light to the peoples. I will bring near my deliverance swiftly. My salvation has gone out and my arms will rule the peoples. The coastlands wait for me and for my arm they hope. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look at the earth beneath. For the heavens will vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment and those who live on it will die like gnats but my salvation will be for ever, and my deliverance will never be ended. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, 
Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Last week I finished off my reflections by explaining how important it is that we remember as members of the Christian Church that our blessings are given to us for a reason. Our blessings are not our property to be guarded against the claims of outsiders, but rather a gracious gift that we are intended, commanded even, to share. We are blessed so that we may in turn be a blessing to others. This week we continue with the theme of what it means to be part of the Christian Church, but it may not be immediately obvious how this particular Gospel reading connects to that theme. So I need to give a, a, a fairly large proportion of today's thoughts to explaining some general facts and principles. As most of you doubtless know, the Bible contains four books that tell us about the life of Jesus. The four Gospels, called Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. These books are sufficiently similar to one another to make it clear that they are telling the same stories about the same events. But they are also quite different, having their own emphases, their individual styles and particular approaches. The individual aspects of each Gospel book are most apparent in one situation above all others where the same episode is recounted in more than one book, but with more detail included in one book than the others. Today's Gospel reading is an example of that. The episode at Caesarea Philippi that we read about from St Matthew's Gospel also appears in St Mark's Gospel and St Luke's Gospel. In all three, Jesus asks his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they reply that he is seen by the crowds as a prophet. Jesus then asks them who they say he is. And Peter replies that Jesus is the Messiah, the Anointed One. But St Matthew tells us a lot more than that. In his account, Jesus explains that this truth has been revealed to Peter by God the Father. Then he says words that I will quote in full now as they appear in our English Bible. You are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This extra detail is telling in itself, as we'll see in a moment, but we need to put it together with other features of St Matthew's Gospel to understand it correctly. Because the church is one of those particular Gospel emphases that I mentioned. In fact, Matthew is the only Gospel in which the word church appears at all. But that's not where it ends. Matthew also includes a lot of details elsewhere about how the Christian community is to conduct itself and about how it relates to the Jewish community out of which it arose. All in all then, St Mark and St Luke recount this episode in a way that makes it a story about the revelation of Jesus' true identity. St Matthew doesn't downplay or deny that in any way. But he goes further by connecting this revelation about who Jesus really is with Jesus' teaching about the consequences of that revelation for the church. Now, these extra words in St Matthew's Gospel have proved to be quite controversial over the years. For some, these words are the biblical foundation of the papacy, 
the allegedly unbroken sequence of bishops of Rome, beginning with St Peter and stretching forwards to the present day Pope. This view is based on a pun in the words of Jesus that isn't immediately apparent in our English Bibles. Peter's name is actually Simon, but he's nicknamed Rock, a bit like Dwayne Johnson, I suppose. So when Jesus says, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, he's making a play on words. And it is argued giving St Peter and his spiritual descendants the preeminence in the church that Roman Catholics have always claimed for the Pope. But partly in reaction against this, others have argued that Jesus isn't even referring to Peter at all at this point. They point to a change in the form of the Greek word for rock halfway through the sentence and argue that we ought to understand Jesus to be referring to himself or perhaps to the faith of the disciples rather than to the man Peter when he says these things. Where well, you can encounter those views and pretty much every shade of opinion uh, in between them if you read into this debate. My own view, for what it's worth, is that it rather tortures the text of the Bible to claim that Jesus is referring to anything or anyone other than Peter when he says, upon this rock, I will build my church. That said, when you take the entirety of what Jesus says here into account and measure it against the teaching of Jesus in other parts of St. Matthew's Gospel and the New Testament as a whole, worrying too much about this particular point masks, I think, the real force of what the passage has to teach us. And I'll finish with a few observations about what those wider lessons are now. First and foremost, and surely beyond any serious doubt, is the lesson that the church is defined by its acknowledgement that Jesus is the Messiah. To be a Christian at all is to recognise that God is present and active in the world in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus' true identity has been revealed by God to Peter and the other disciples. So whatever else this passage is telling us, it is absolutely affirming the centrality and the primacy of Jesus himself in the life and the work of the church. It's also, I think, telling us something about the location of the church. Notice that Jesus says some pretty mysterious things about Hades and heaven and earth, and I could take several weeks to unpack those for you. Right now I have just a few moments, so I will simply say that the church is called to exist at the intersection of earth and heaven. We are called to pray on earth as it is in heaven and to put our backs into being part of the answer to our own prayer. Joining in with God's work to bring earth into closer alignment with heaven is our core calling. And finally, the passage is telling us something about the authority of the church. A lot of people have worried that overstating the authority given to St. Peter repre represents some diminution in the authority of Jesus. That is, for me, a false opposite. All authority in heaven and on earth is given to Jesus. And if Jesus chooses to delegate that authority to some degree, who are we to argue? But I think it's also important to recognise that these words of Jesus represent as much a warning as they do a promise. The authority that Je Jesus gives to his church is real and its effects reach beyond the confines of this world into the mysteries of eternity. That shouldn't make us giddy and jumped up like teenagers in a shopping mall with a no limit credit card. It should rather humble us and bring us constantly back to our prayer, thy will be done. There is so much here in this short gospel reading that I have inevitably skated quite lightly over a number of its features. I do encourage you to reflect further on it and to contact me if you want to discuss it. Meanwhile, we pray for grace to live up to the challenge of our calling as the Church of Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We give you thanks and praise for you are the Christ, 
the Son of the living God. Everlasting God, we thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and for revealing him as Messiah and Saviour of the world. Thank you for Peter, his lively and outspoken faith, and for the foundation of your church here on earth. We pray for your church, that it might always provide a solid foundation upon which we can anchor our lives. We pray for the Anglican Church of the province of Southeast Asia, the Most Reverend Mel Tateus. For bishops, David, Nicholas and Christopher here in Lincoln, and for Hugh and Alice, as they minister to us at St Nicholas. For those who live and work on Mount Street and Nam Place, the children going back to Mount Street School in September, and all who work there. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We especially pray for Christians who pay a heavy price for their faith, who daily experience hostility from their governments, employers and neighbours as a result of believing in you. O oh God, author of life and lover of concord, with you is perfect freedom and peace. Visit this day all places of violence and unrest, of injustice and war. We ask for peace and reconciliation for the people of the Lebanon, Belarus, South Sudan and Mali, all longing for a life free from war and dictatorship, for freedom and justice and for food for their children. Transform all pride and corruption into a heart for the common good. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we pray for all young people who have received exam results. Those with aching hearts and shattered dreams, be with them as they make decisions and wait for new directions and possibilities. May there be unexpected blessings. May there be humble le leadership. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, we pray for the ill, the lonely and the distressed. For those in fear of the coronavirus. For all relatives, the sick and the dying this day. Those who are separated from their loved ones and ache to be in the same room as those they love. May your healing presence be our strength and inspiration. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, we remember those who have recently died and those we remember from past years. We name them before you now in our hearts. We know through faith that they are safe with you. Comfort the bereaved in their loneliness and be their strength. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Take everything from us that keeps us from you this day. Give everything to us that guides us to you. Take all of us and make us all your own. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, 
as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his son Jesus Christ our Lord and the blessing of God Almighty the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>